Our topic this morning really falls upon a, within a broader, uh, more important and universal banner, and that is reading the entire Bible, including the Old Testament. Um, I'd like to share a quote from Ray Stedman. He's got a neat uh, introductory book called Adventuring Through the Bible. And in chapter 29, Ray Stedman is providing an intro to the, the books of the prophets. And uh, he says this, he says, the purpose of the Old Testament is to prepare us to receive the truth from God. Most of us begin our Christian experience by reading the New Testament. Many of us, unfortunately, never seem to get around reading the Old Testament. But I'm convinced after years of observation, both in my own life and in the life of others, that we can only go so far uh, in appropriating the truths of the New Testament without beginning to understand the Old Testament. Without a firm foundation in the Old Testament, we cannot fully grasp all the riches of the New Testament. Ray goes on to say, in the prophetical books, we discover the mighty promises of God. The better we understand God's promises, the better we understand his nature and his character. And finally, uh, Ray finishes with this line of thinking by saying the promises of God have earned the right to be trusted. They are sure they're dependable. These promises are the foundation of our faith. Without them, we have no objective reason to trust the Bible. Because God has kept all his promises down through history, we can believe everything else that he tells us in his word. So what do you think? Does Ray have a point? You agree? Amen. Yeah. So the question is, well, what, what do we do with this point that Ray made? Well, this morning, we're going to provide a high level overview of the books of the Bible known as the prophets a prophet primer of sorts. So with such grand aspirations and goals, I think we should start by taking our time to the Lord. So let's bow our heads and, and pray. Um, Lord, you are faithful. We know you are faithful because you keep your promises, promises to individuals, promises to peoples, promises to nations and promises to yourself. You are the great promise keeper. Thank you for speaking through the prophets in the Bible. We want to understand your nature and character by understanding your promises and how you have and will keep them. Bless our time together that we may collectively grow and encourage one another with a commitment to your word. Amen. So I timed myself on this morning, this, this morning, it's going to be a short sermon, but it's going to be a, a dense one, a thick one. So just let's all hang here together. So uh, I don't know if you know this, but over three quarters of the words in the Bible are in the Old Testament. 77% of the words in the Bible are in the Old Testament. Uh, I knew it was a large fraction, but that number actually surprised me a bit. Um, so if you have a paper Bible, analog Bible, let's do a little tactile exercise here. I want you to turn to the Old Testament and find Isaiah. Okay, so Psalms, Proverbs. Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then Isaiah. It's darn near, it's about 40% the way through, all right? Put your left hand right there at the beginning of Isaiah. Now take your right hand and go find the beginning of Matthew, okay? And then hold that up. That right there is 20% of the Bible. One-fifth of the entire Bible is in the books called the Prophets. That's a lot, we're not going to cover it all today, right? But we are going to talk about what's in that slice of the Bible. Okay. It's super important and super valuable. So you can, you can let that go now. Okay. And obviously on your phone, it's a lot easier to do that because you just flick around and find it, but this provides, you know, the tactile feel. So that section of the old Testament is 17 books and it's commonly referred to as the prophets. Um, you know, the Old Testament is organized by genre. 
and it's somewhat chronological, but it does hop around a little bit. There are b- versions of the Bible that are actually written in a chronological sense, study Bible, so you can follow it through chronologically. Um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time later this morning discussing the timelines of the prophetic books. So perhaps a visual summary of the Old Testament is helpful at this point. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. So this is a chart. I use several charts from Rose's book of charts. I love the book. It just visually, it does an excellent job of, of presenting things. But these are the books of the Old Testament. And you can see that over on the right, we've got our major prophets. The book, there's five books that are considered major prophets. And then there are the 12 or the minor prophets. Now, each of these books was written by a namesake. Uh, the only exception is Lamentations. That was, uh, they're pretty sure, written by Jeremiah. But other than that, the name of the prophet is the name of the book. Um, and just an important note about vernacular, major and minor have nothing to do with uh, importance or value. It has to do with the size of the book. So the minor prophets were brief (laughs) and the major prophets had more to say. So let's start off with a few bedrock principles, three things. So number one, what is a prophet in the Bible? Well, simply stated, a prophet was a spokesperson on God's behalf. Second, what did the prophets talk about? Well, Sometimes they talked about events from the past. An example is the Exodus from Egypt. Sometimes they talk about events in the present. Examples include worshiping false gods, injustice, corruption, uh, foreign alliances. And sometimes they talk about events in the future. Examples include judgment of nations and restoration of nations. So, Third, what is the difference between a prophet, the person, and a prophetic book? Well, there are lots of people in the Bible that are referred to as prophets that don't have a book named after them. Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, Elisha, John the Baptist, even Jesus were called prophets at one time or another. What we're going to discuss today are the authors and the namesake Old Testament books referred to as the prophets. So before we launch off into an overview of the prophets, there are two categories, kind of adjacent information that I think is key to understanding the prophets. So one category of adjacent information is the nation of Israel itself, specifically the timelines and the overlay with the kings of the united and divided kingdoms. A picture's worth a thousand words, so I'm going to lean on the incredible work of others to help you show you what I'm talking about. Thanks again, Matt. So this is the handout that you have. It's double-sided. We're going to talk about the front, and then we're going to talk about the back. Um, Some of you may already, well, I already said that, so I'll skip it. Um, Is there anyone that doesn't have one in here that would like one? Okay, we're good. Okay, it was funny. Karen asked me Thursday night if I was going to warn people that part of this sermon was going to be a history lesson. (laughs) And I said, yes, 100% yes. It's impossible to understand the prophets we're addressing if we don't understand what the kingdom and the kings and the culture were doing at that time. So for some of you, this is all well known. And for some, it may be new and overwhelming. And for some, you may hate history. So bear with me. So let's start at the top of this graphic. So about 3000 years ago, around 1050 BC, the nation of Israel began clamoring for a king. We want a king just like our neighbors. Israel's king was supposed to be the Lord. The prophet Samuel, and you can see Samuel so that the red lines, those are prophets. And then you've got the United Kingdom up top and the divided kingdom down below. So Samuel is up on the far right. Um, The prophet Samuel lived at that time. And you can read about what went on with him in first and second Samuel. Well, God said he would give Israel a king, 
But Israel would soon discover that a human king will fall short of God's standard and the people's expectations. Saul was anointed king and it didn't go well for Saul, for his family, or the nation. So after Saul, you move down, you can see David became king. David was a a man after God's own heart. Most of you are familiar with David's successes and his failures, defeating Goliath, winning wars, unifying tribes, people and tribes and land, committing adultery with Bathsheba, facilitating Bathsheba's husband Uriah's death, and a family in absolute turmoil. Well, David and Bathsheba's son, Solomon, next reign at the peak of Israel's glory. Prosperousness, peace, prominence, respect, and the construction of the first temple known as Solomon's temple. Well, Solomon was succeeded by his son, Rehoboam. Instead of listening to wise counsel, Rehoboam listened to his young friends who advised him to come down hard on the 10 Northern kingdom uh, tribes, right? There were 12 tribes total and he did so. And how did the Northern kingdom respond? Well, they responded by breaking off and forming their own nation. We now have a Northern kingdom. We now have a Southern kingdom, 10 tribes, two tribes, king, king. Um, they, and they did that in 931 BC and all hell broke loose literally and figuratively. So over approximately 210 years, the Northern kingdom of Israel had 19 Kings, each and every one of them was characterized as bad, right? When you read through that, they characterize them as a good King or bad. They were all characterized as bad. And over approximately 345 years, the Southern kingdom of Judah had 20 Kings. And of these eight were characterized as bad, better than the North. But as we'll see, it still doesn't end up in a good place. It is at this time of the divided kingdoms that the prominent prophets began their ministry. Elijah and Elisha, prophesied during this period of the divided kingdoms. We also have Jonah, Amos, Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah prophesying during this period. So those are the names that you can see in the middle and the timelines of when they were prophesying. Then something major happens in 722 BC, following years of incursions And skirmishes, Assyria finally wipes out the 10 northern tribes of the kingdom of Israel. The people are either exiled to other Assyrian lands, they're scattered to other locations, including the southern kingdom, or number three, they're left to suffer and scrape out existence in the same lands. Jonah, Hosea, and Amos prophesied during the decline of the northern kingdom. And Isaiah and Micah actually saw it destroyed. When you read these prophets, this is the background behind their experience. Unfortunately, the Southern kingdom of Judah didn't have much longer to exist. Another 136 years to be exact. So your handout is double sided. So now we're looking at the other side. The Northern kingdom has disappeared. Now it's just the Southern kingdom hanging on. So here we see the Kings of Judah and the prophets that lived and prophesied during the end of Judah's existence. So we have Nahum, Daniel, Zephaniah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Obadiah, and Jeremiah join the list of rosters. If you're a young set, of a couple and you're going to have kids, this is a great list of names to draw from. So they saw a familiar decline Uh, with bad Kings, they saw social decay. They saw corruption. They saw false idols. They saw unhealthy foreign alliances. They even saw child sacrifice. 
and the increasingly hostile and frequent attacks by the Assyrians and the new to the scene, the Babylonians. So now before we go any further, I want to inject a second category of adjacent information, right? So we just talked about the kings and the timelines, but now I want to talk about the major nations that overlap with the united, divided, and destroyed and restored kingdoms. These nations are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, and what's called Medo-Persia, or just Persians would sometimes use. Thank you, Matt. So although most of our familiarity with Egypt is associated with the enslavement of the Hebrews and their subsequent exodus under Moses's leadership, Egypt continues to be a major player in the geopolitics of the region for thousands of years. Israel would vacillate between alliances and conflict with Egypt throughout its its existence, excuse me. And even Egypt would be occupied or other imp- otherwise impacted by the great empires. There's a reason why there's Persian, Greek, and Roman architecture in Egypt today, right? Because they were getting taken over just like everybody else. So that's Egypt. And then we have Assyria. You can see Assyria in the uh, top up there. Assyrian empire lasted about 250 years and they were known for their brutality. We finished our study of Jonah not long ago. And we learned how Jonah would rather drown in the ocean than go to Nineveh and tell the Ninevites to repent. The prophet Nahum speaks of Nineveh's wickedness and their brutality and their pride. So Nineveh was destroyed by the Babylonians in 612 BC. Every empire does this. Our country is not immune to this. And uh, it was, uh, Nineveh was destroyed in 612 BC and it actually laid buried under the sand until 1845 when it was uncovered by archeologists. 2,400 years later, it just ceased to exist and nobody even knew where it was. This is the empire that destroyed the Northern kingdom of Israel, the Assyrians, and they continued to pressure the Southern kingdom of Judah. So that's the second one, Egypt and Assyria. The third one, the Babylonian empire, the Babylonian empire knocked off the Assyrians as the big kid on the block. As we've mentioned, the mighty Assyrian capital of Nineveh fell to the Babylonians in 612 BC. And the Babylonians crushed the Egyptian armies as well in 605 BC. And as we will soon see, the Babylonians would eventually spell the end of the Southern kingdom of Judah. And as we will discuss shortly, the Medo-Persian, or I'll just call them the Persian empire for short, would eventually knock off the Babylonians in 539 BC. Empires come and go. This is the way of the world even today. So remember each of these four empires, they will significantly impact the experiences and the destiny of the Southern kingdom. So now let's go back to our timeline showing the balance of the Southern kingdom's existence. So with its Northern neighbor, Israel destroyed and scattered, Judah continued to suffer under bad Kings and foreign pressure. In fact, six of the seven last Kings in the Southern kingdom were bad. This was the beginning of the end for the Southern kingdom of Judah. The end was comprised of three major exiles. Okay. So first in 605 BC, the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem and carried away Jews to exile in Babylon. This was a 500 mile walk. It would be like walking from here to Portland and back in the desert among this group, the 605 exilees was Daniel and the prophet Jeremiah saw it all happen. That's the first one. Second, then in 597 BC, the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem a second time. They carried away about 10,000 Jews to Babylon. The prophet Ezekiel was among this group exiled to Babylon. And in 586 BC, this is the third one, 
The Babylonians had had enough of Judah's resistance, rebellion, and shenanigans. The Babylonians destroyed the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and exiled most of the remaining Jews. Jeremiah lived through this time. He wrote the book of Lamentations as he reflected on the downfall and the suffering of Jerusalem. Excuse me, 586 is probably one of the important dates to try to remember from the Old Testament. (coughs) Excuse me, this was the year that the nation of Israel ceased to exist. And Solomon's temple was destroyed, a true milestone in the history of the world. Fortunately, God had a plan, a plan for restoration. After 70 years, so you can see that little white gap in the drawing. That's the 70 years in exile. Um, After 70 years of exile in Babylon and Persia taking over from Babylon, the Persian king Cyrus allowed the exiled Jews to return to their homeland and build Jerusalem. The wall in the temple known as the second temple or Zerubbabel's temple. <clears throat> this is the backdrop for the books of Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah. It is this season that the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and Joel prophesy. So Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, <clears throat> about 400 years before Christ. This 400 years is called the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's 400 years. And this time was anything but boring. Alexander the Great came in and overtook the rule from the uh, Persians. Greek language and culture were injected into the region. The Greek Hellenistic period morphed into a fractured, evolving mix of post-Alexander leaders and Jewish factions. We've talked about Antiochus Epiphanes, the fourth, the Ptolemies, the Seleucids. This was all happening during that time. And finally, in 63 BC, it was Rome's turn. They marched in and took over. It is under Roman rule that the New Testament arrives, introducing John the Baptist, Jesus, the apostles, and the early church. That was a lot. When you read the Old Testament, understanding the geopolitics and the cultures are important. This provides the necessary background and context for the prophets, the time they lived, what they saw, and what God told them to say, to do, and to write. So understanding what was happening inside and adjacent to Israel and the Jewish people isn't just helpful. It's crucial to understanding the Old Testament. So now let's revisit our Old Testament books called the prophets. So we've covered a lot and I'm going to share a few. Well, let me back up. I was just thinking this morning, what do we do? Where do we go from here? Well, we can't talk about 20% of the entire Bible in the next 10 or 15 minutes. That seems like a crazy bookend. And we can't just ignore. (laughs) We need to talk a little bit about what the prophets said. So I thought a lot about that and I'm going to share a few highlights related to each book. So this is in no way a substitute for you reading them. In fact, by trying to briefly characterize any of the books, I'm at risk of radically oversimplifying the message of each prophet. I'll give you, I'll give it a shot. And I ask for your grace in this area. I'm relying on my own reading notes made over the years and references such as Ray Stedman's um, adventuring through the Bible. There's a book I'll talk about a little bit later called the Bible at 30,000 feet and the Rose book of charts and maps and timelines. I'll summarize all these, these references and resources at the end. (coughs) Excuse me. So before I share a bit regarding each prophet, It's going to be challenging for any of you that take notes. I mean, Karen and I try to take notes every Sunday and there's just a lot here. So you might consider just simply listening to the flow of information and see if you can discern the, and and the themes and the consistencies at at all. Um, Perhaps it's kind of like listening to a symphony of God speaking through his prophets. So here we go. 
And just, just listen to the flow of this. So Isaiah, well, let's begin with Isaiah. Isaiah reveals the full dimension of God's judgment and his salvation. In fact, Isaiah 52, 13 through Isaiah 53, 12 is the most frequently quoted Old Testament scripture quoted in the New Testament. It's often referred to as the gospel in the Old Testament. And in Luke 4, 16 through 21, Jesus applies Isaiah 61 to himself after reading it aloud in the synagogue at his hometown in Nazareth. The people were offended and tried to throw Jesus off a cliff because he was basically saying he was the Messiah. Jesus made it clear that he is the Messiah and that his rejection by fellow Jews would push the gospel message out to the Gentiles. So those are some sample things that Isaiah talked about. Jeremiah. Well, Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible. Jeremiah has been called the weeping prophet. He had a faithful assistant named Baruch. Again, there's a name for you young families. Jeremiah had a front row seat to the decline, the decay, and the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem, the southern kingdom. When he brought this to the attention of his peers or the king, he was treated poorly. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was even lowered into a muddy cistern, or a, you know, a water storage or a well. Following the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 586 B.C., Jeremiah and Baruch were, were uh, taken to Egypt. Jeremiah predicted 70 years of exile for his countrymen. Jeremiah is the only prophet to quote another prophet, the prophet Micah. Jeremiah wrote a letter to the Jews exiled in 597, which would have included Ezekiel. And in Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah announces a new covenant new minds, new hearts, and forgiveness. This is the only mention of the phrase new covenant in the Old Testament. Lamentations, Jewish and Christian tradition ascribe the book to Jeremiah. Lamentation is just, lamentations is just, just that, laments, only laments. The book is a poem about the destruction of Israel. It is read aloud by Orthodox Jews on the ninth day of Ab, the Hebrew calendar, the traditional date of the destruction of Solomon's temple in 586 and Herod's temple in AD 70. Many also read it weekly at the Western or Wailing Wall. The book of Lamentations speaks of devastation, cannibalism, exiling, and the end of ceremony and worship at the temple. The book ends with a plea for restoration. Ezekiel. Remember Ezekiel was exiled to Babylon in that sec that second exile 597. And he began his ministry 4 years later. The book of Ezekiel has more dates in it than any other Old Testament prophetic book. Ezekiel prophesied for 7 years before the destruction of Israel. And he prophesied another 15 years after the destruction of Israel. So when the temple in Jerusalem were destroyed, somebody ultimately came up and told Ezekiel what had happened. Ezekiel emphasizes God's initiative and control over creation, essentially his sovereignty. The phrase, then they will know that I am the Lord, occurs 65 times in Ezekiel, emphasizing that God will be known and he will be acknowledged. The book contains visions, symbolic acts, and parables, and it presents God's saving purposes in the history of the world. Daniel. So for those of you who were here in 2020 and 2021, we studied the book of Daniel. And ironically, during the COVID shutdowns and related government edicts, very powerful message to study at that time. Daniel was a teenager exiled by the Babylonians in 605 BC, and he and his friends were subjected to efforts to train and be brainwashed into the culture. The theme of Daniel is God's sovereignty presented as historical narrative and apocalyptic material. 
Daniel includes in part a substantial use of the Aramaic language. There's only three places, I think, in the Old Testament where the language of Aramaic is used because it was the language everyone understood during the exile. Daniel interpreted dreams. His friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived the fiery furnace. Daniel survived the lion's den. Daniel had visions. And Daniel predicts with uncanny accuracy political events during that 400-year intertestamental period. And he makes the first clear reference of resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked, wicked, as well as the only Old Testament reference to everlasting life. Hosea. Hosea is the only writing prophet to come from the northern kingdom of Israel. His is the first, he is the first of the minor prophets. And again, those prophets are called the 12. He lived during the final, tragic final days of the northern kingdom. God ordered Hosea to marry an adulterous wife, Gomer, and their three children were each given symbolic names. This was all symbolic of God's relationship with the adulterous nation of Israel. Baal worship, sacrifices at high places, sacred prostitutes, worshiping calf images, international intrigue, and materialism were all in play. Despite all this, Hosea proclaims God's compassion and love for Israel. Joel. Joel sees a massive locust plague and severe drought devastating Judah as a harbinger of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He calls on everyone to repent. He describes the day as one of punishment for unfaithful Israel. Amos. Uh, Amos was a blue collar kind of guy. He had flocks. He had a fig grove. And although he lived in the Southern King of Judah, he was sent to announce God's judgment on the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Idolatry, indulgence, immorality, corruption, and oppression were the order of the day. Amos declared that the Lord or that God was going to judge his unfaithful, disobedient covenant breaking people. They would be uprooted at the hands of a pagan nation. Obadiah. Obadiah announced God's punishment of neighboring Edom. Edom had been hostile to Israel for all of Israel's existence. And Edom had gloated over Israel's devastation by foreign powers. This book is shortened to the point. Edom will be, will cease to exist. Obadiah is the shortest book in the old Testament. It's 21 verses long. Concise. Jonah. We've completed our study of Jonah a few months ago. Jonah is the story of God's desire for our obedience, forgiveness, and repentance. Micah. Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah and Hosea. He predicted the fall of the Northern kingdom and inevitable desolation of the Southern kingdom. Micah expressed deep sensitivity to the social ills of his day. His theme is one of judgment and deliverance of God. <clears throat> Micah 6, 8 states, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your Lord. This beautiful verse is sometimes misused by wayward churches to make social justice reform the identity, focus, and purpose of the church rather than the gospel of repentance, obedience, forgiveness, and love. Nahum. Nahum's theme is the fall of the city of Nineveh. Although addressed primarily to Nineveh, Nahum also had words for Judah. Nineveh's oppression, their cruelty, the idolatry, idolatry, and their wickedness is called out. The book ends with the destruction of the city of Nineveh. Nahum points out that kingdoms built on wickedness and tyranny must eventually fall as Assyria did. Habakkuk. Well, Habakkuk was a contemporary of Jeremiah. He predicted the coming Babylon, Babylonian invasion. And Habakkuk uh, is unique in that it includes no oracle addressed to Israel. It contains rather a dialogue between the prophet and God. 
God makes it clear that a corrupt destroyer will itself be destroyed. Habakkuk learns to rest in God's sovereignty, plan, and timeline. Habakkuk 2.4 states, the righteous will live by his faith. This clause is quoted frequently in the New Testament to support the teaching that the people, that people are saved by grace through faith. It became the rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. A couple more here. Zephaniah. So Zephaniah was a fourth generation, a descendant of Judah's King Hezekiah. And Zephaniah shows a lot of familiarity with court circles and political issues. He prophesied during the reign of King Zosiah. So he was a contemporary of Jeremiah, Nahum, and possibly Habakkuk. Zephaniah announced to Judah, God's approaching judgment. His main theme is the coming of the day of the Lord. Like other prophets, he mixes his pronouncements of doom with Judah's future restoration. Haggai. Haggai, along with Zechariah, encouraged the returned exilees to rebuild the temple. So you can see in that, um, well, on the drawing on your lap, that after the intertestamental, or the, excuse me, the 70 year exile, they, they were released to come back by the king of Persia. And so when you read, uh, Nehemiah, you read Ezra, you read Esther, those books are all referring to that. Um, Zechariah rebuked the returnees from exile and encouraged them to complete rebuilding the temple. There are substantial messianic as well as end times themes in Zechariah. Regarding the Messiah, Zechariah foretold, get this, Christ's coming in lowliness, his humanity, his rejection and betrayal for 30 pieces of silver, his crucifixion, his priesthood, his kingship, his coming in glory, his building of the Lord's temple, his reign, and his establishment of enduring peace and prosperity. The dominant emphasis of the book is encouragement. And last but not least, Malachi. The returnees from exile began to doubt God's love and justice, and they lost hope. Their worship degenerated into going through the motions, and they no longer took the law seriously. Malachi rebukes their doubt and faithlessness. It is only through repentance and reformation that Israel will ever again receive God's blessing. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and he lays the groundwork for the coming Elijah fulfilled in John the Baptist. So again, as you listen to those summaries, were there some consistent themes, perhaps the duality of God's wrath and restoration, perhaps God's justice, perhaps the timelessness of man's wickedness, perhaps our need for reminders and encouragement, perhaps God's sovereignty. Well, there you have it. Those are the books called the prophets. We've discussed what was going on inside Israel. And we've discussed what was going on with adjacent kingdoms outside Israel. <clears throat> and we discussed the major and minor prophets, the books they wrote, and at a very high level, what they said on behalf of God. So I'm going to make a plug for memorizing some key dates during that period. I highlighted three in red and a couple in not sure what color that is yellowish. Um, <clears throat> you know, the destruction of the Northern kingdom in 722 BC is a commonly referenced date as it is the destruction of the, uh, as is the destruction of the Southern kingdom in 586 BC. So you have study Bible or, or uh, historical stuff. Those are big dates <clears throat> and the rebuilding of the temple when they returned from exile in 516 is important, especially because it's exactly 70 years after the first temple was destroyed. So it's fulfillment of prophecy and God uh, fulfilling his promise. I also think it's valuable to know there were three exiles and with some of the prophets being exiled, right? 605, Daniel, part of that one, 597, Ezekiel, part of that one, 
and 586, the big and final one. So I'll put one last slide up for your consideration. So these are some of my favorite study guides. So if you want to go a little deeper, these are excellent introductory tools. First of all, a modern study Bible is truly incredible. Uh, the, the notes, the charts, the timelines, the context, the cultural things, all that is just really valuable. I'm so impressed with people that didn't have a study Bible in the past and, you, and they had to just pour through this stuff and infer the historical context and other things. We are really blessed. And we have a, a, a set of shells in the room back here. We have some study Bibles. If you're serious about it and you want one, you can have one. Okay? Um, highly recommended. I'd also recommend some Cliff Notes guides like Ray Stedman's Adventuring Through the Bible or Skip Heitzig's The Bible from 30,000 Feet. I'm a big fan of Rose Book of Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines. What we use today is just an example of what's in there. It's awesome. In fact, I borrowed all of today's charts from this reference. And finally, a book such as Manners and Customs of the Bible is excellent to understand what was going on back then. So I know we've covered a lot today, and if you'd like a copy of these notes and the slides, uh, please contact Erica in the office, and we're happy to get that to you. And Rose's book, you can get a printed copy, but uh, they have a PDF of the entire book that's available for anybody that wants to use it for non-commercial purposes. So this is all done in alignment with copyright rules, but you can get one downloaded offline or online, excuse me. Um, so I would encourage each of us to commit to reading all of God's word, not just the verses Matt covers on Sunday, not just a daily devotion, not just books about the Bible, not just the Bible on audio. Let's commit to reading the Bible frequently, regularly, and comprehensively. The books of the prophets spring to life when we understand how, when, and why they were written. Uh, the people, the cultures, and the nations from 2,700 to 2,400 years ago, they struggled with the same exact things that we do today. So let's learn from these timeless words, words that help us know who God is, his promises fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled, and his plan for all of creation, including his church, CCF, and each of us. So let's close in prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us your written word. Thank you for those that have been faithful throughout the uh, centuries to keep the word straight so that we can get it here thousands of years later. And Lord, we just pray that you'd give us a heart of longing to know you and through that longing to know your word and to spend time in it, make it a priority, make it a focus, make it a commitment, make it something that we can fellowship around, Lord. Lord, again, we just uh, thank you for your presence. We thank you for an opportunity to uh, soak up your word this morning. In your name, amen. Thank you, everybody. If you can't guess, you're dismissed.